uh, many people heard about uh, GAN models and the VAE models. Uh, you know, they were considered by uh, some to be one of the most exciting development in machine learning, or at least in deep learning over the past decade. And you will see a reason today. Uh, I personally also consider this to be a brilliant piece of work. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, my presentation today is going to uh, trivialize it, not in terms of the contribution, but term in terms of the mathematical details. It's not that complicated so that you can actually totally understand it and hopefully use it easily, right? And uh, my colleague, uh, Jiting and the others will be giving you more concrete uh, examples and building blocks in the next few lectures about uh, this line of work. As I mentioned uh, in my previous lecture, uh, there are deeper, very deep connections uh, between, the, between almost every piece in deep learning uh, and uh, their counterpart in machine learning, which were invented uh, decades ago. For example, if you still remember, you know, a uh, deep neural network uh, could be uh, understood as a uh, infinite uh, uh, deep, uh, uh, you know, uh, computing graph of uh, a uh, one layer restrictive Boltzmann machine, right? What I didn't say also in the same lecture, but it's left in the uh, reading material is that an infinitely wide deep neural network also corresponds to a finite ways uh, Gaussian uh, process uh, in the deep neural network. And there are all these uh, interesting counterparts between classical graphical model uh, machinery and technique and their deep learning counterpart. And I think understanding these connections is uh, allowing you to understand some of the phenomena and also to come up with uh, more easily the innovations and the new extensions. So today we are going to talk about uh, this topic. Uh, I think uh, it's a very interesting topic. In fact, uh, just by looking at this graph, you already find it exciting, right? Uh, it, the, one of the uh, early uh, you know, amazement over deep generative models is that it can produce some uh, amazing outcomes like this you can turn a regular picture into a, say, a Van Gogh picture or a Da Vinci picture just by doing some style transfer. So why that happens and, uh, and uh, how many different ways we can do this. Okay, so uh, what's behind such family of uh, uh, technique is uh, a deep generative model. And we are very familiar with the generative models already. And what does a deep generative model mean? It means that uh, you just uh, have multiple layers of hidden variable now, instead of just having one or two more layers. So it is a graphical model. Okay, in this case, uh, it is uh, coming from uh, K layers until you see the observation here. And of course, you can expand this to be a uh, uh, wider uh, array of uh, generative models and uh, connect them in a bipartite way uh, in you know, uh, arbitrary deep fashion. And this is uh, the gist of uh, deep generative models. And uh, just to uh, ground uh, to a few concrete examples, for example, uh, we've learned already a sigma belief network where the lower layer is the conditioning on the previous layer using a uh, conditional distribution defined by a sigma function. And that means that uh, the lower layer follows a Bernoulli distribution whose parameters are dependent, uh, defined by you know, this function, right? And of course, you can relay these uh, to multiple layers. And uh, we have, uh, in fact, that leads to the hierarchical Bayesian models, you know, uh, deep belief networks and so forth, which actually is uh, uh, you know, a, uh, maybe one of the first uh, uh, deep learning models in its current sense, where you train you know, blockwise uh, RBMs, and then you stack them on top of each other, and then you retrain them using a uh, autoregressive functions or some other heuristics. So you can see that uh, uh, graphical model is very principled. It has uh, all sorts of mathematical properties to tell you the behavior. And then the deep learning model or deep learning technique is uh, a uh, heuristic extension of that 
Uh, in fact, the very word model is uh, not quite appropriate because sometimes it is uh, not a model, but it is only a technique built on a uh, principled model, but giving you more flexibility and uh, functionality. For example, one of the uh, alternative deep generative model is known as uh, the Helmholtz machine. Okay, Helmholtz machine is actually, you know, if you talk about only the model, it is uh, just uh, a undirected uh, uh, Markov random field of multiple layers. But uh, why uh, it's becoming interesting and it has its new name? It's because uh, this model is learned in a very peculiar way, okay, as shown in this graph. Basically, if you recall, you know, for uh, any you know, larger graphic model, if uh, you really are following a, uh, maybe a directionality from you know, hidden to observe, you usually have a two passage algorithm where you, you know, just imagine the EM step, right? You need to uh, you know, uh, learn uh, the estimation of uh, the parameters of the generative models. And then you need to, you know, in the E step, infer all the hidden variables. These are hidden variables, you need to infer it using the posterior distribution of the hidden variable given the observation, and then you re-estimate the parameters, right? That's what's EM algorithm. And then in our variational principle, we say that uh, we can introduce, uh, you know, what is known as uh, a variational approximation, Q of uh, Z given theta, uh, given X, to approximate the posterior of Z given X. And then you are going to use this uh, variational to impute the hidden random variables and then you still go to the M step to estimate the parameters, right? So this Helmholtz machine is essentially, you know, taking the approach of uh, using a very special, you know, uh, a variational approximation, which uh, is uh, a new model. It's called the inference model that uh, you basically just, uh, you know, uh, learn this P and learn this Q separately and uh, using the Q to impute the value of the hidden random variables. So Helmholtz machine is, is, is essentially an alternative for inference and learning methods. Okay, its parallel is basically a MCMC or maybe some other approximate technique, all working on the same model. So it is not a different model. Okay, so that basically gives you already a dimension where the deep learning technique is going. Sometimes they introduce a new approximation or heuristics uh, to you know, uh, toward estimating a complex model, and the resultant model is your, uh, you know, uh, uh, favorite uh, deep learning model. And uh, there is another, yet another way to innovate uh, deep learning models. For example, uh, Schmiderhaber, you know, many, many years ago, uh, invented a model called uh, predictability minimization, okay? In this case, it is, again, a graphical model and uh, again, it can be deep if you add multiple layers. But uh, in this case, uh, the loss function was kind of interesting. Why it is called the predictive minimization? It's because uh, the goodness of the hidden variables are introduced such that they basically are, uh, you, know, uh, you know, first of all, you know, they are ideally uh, independent of each other between these different hidden variables. And how to quantify their, their uh, independence is that we need to use uh, each of uh, you know, uh, the random variable uh, to predict other random variables. For example, this one is a mirror of this one and uh, it can be predicted from here, okay? So we want to learn a model such that uh, these two guys can predict this guy very, very accurately. But uh, this guy, which is the mirror of this black one, is uh, having a value such that it is very hard to predict. So there is this uh, you know, uh, contention or competition or rivalry between two forces. One is that uh, you want to learn a model such that uh, the set of random variables are able to predict the remaining ones okay, due to any measure of predictability. On the other hand, the remaining ones are taking the value that makes it very hard to predict. So is this familiar to you? Well, 
you probably heard that many years ago there was a uh, fight, you know, not a fight, it's kind of a disagreement between Young Goodfellow and uh, Schmidt Haber in, uh, in, uh, in Google, uh, you know, in uh, NIPS conference uh, over who invented the GAN model. Of course, uh, Young believed he invented the GAN model, but uh, Jurgen uh, also uh, have a different opinion. He thought uh, the idea behind the GAN model is no different from uh, this PM machine because it is uh, about uh, predictability and, uh, and uh, able to uh, uh, truthfully uh, tell whether it is a real source or fake source and so forth. This uh, uh, discriminator or this uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, adversarial loss kind of spirit was already in here. Right. So that basically tells you a new dimension of a deep learning model. They sometimes introducing very novel uh, loss functions such as in the PM machine. Okay, so the world model here is not very rigorous anymore. You know, it's really uh, better uh, maybe uh, expressed in terms of a technique. Okay, so deep learning technique maybe is uh, more uh, maybe uh, accurate than deep learning models because sometimes the model remains the same, but uh, depending on what technique you use to learn the model, you get very different things. Okay, so uh, let's uh, maybe uh, also take a quick look about uh, the method, at least for estimating those models in the early days. So far, we've learned the following things. Uh, Imagine that uh, you need to estimate all these uh, latent variables and the one of the fundamental technique of estimating latent variables for the learning is to use a sampling or augmentation method. You basically, you know, uh, you, know, uh, you know, treating the set of hidden variables as uh, different sets and then you iteratively sample one of the sets given the others and also given the evidence X. Okay, that's uh, a common technique. And uh, then uh, we also learned uh, a variational inference method which defines a loss function that is the lower bound of the likelihood. Okay? And then you are going to you know, basically learn uh, both the model parameters theta and also the variational parameters phi which uh, maximize this lower bound of the likelihood. Okay, if you don't recall that, go back to the literature and the, uh, the, the lecture notes and uh, hopefully uh, the refresh yourself. There is a third algorithm, wake sleep. We actually mentioned this name already, which is a little bit uh, even more funny. It actually, so if you remember this, this actually does uh, one relaxation of the true loss. This is the true loss and this is the first relaxation, right? It is longer the, you know, the, the loss itself. What's happening in the wake sleep, as you will see in a second, is that it does uh, one more relaxation, actually two relaxations, in which in the wake step, they're going to minimize uh, this loss, and uh, in the sleep phase, they're going to minimize a different loss. And these two losses are different. Therefore, at the end of the day, they will converge somewhere, but you don't actually exactly know what they are. But you kind of have a uh, faith that uh, they are close to what you want. Okay, so it's becoming a pure procedure rather than you know, a, uh, a algorithm that uh, uh, solves you know, a consistent problem. That, that's wake sleep. And we will see actually exactly why this is necessary in this particular need. Okay? So with the invention of all these heuristics and algorithms and the models, you know, there's of course you know, a resurgence of uh, deep generative models. We know RBM. The stacking of RBM allows you to train very deep generative models uh, such as uh, DBN and the others. You already see some of them uh, in previous lectures. And uh, now you know, uh, comes to uh, the modern day uh, two superstars in this space. One is known as the variational autoencoders. So what is variational autoencoder? It's actually uh, Again, you know, I'm going to say a few words. All this naming convention makes things a little bit confusing. Now we have uh, autoencoder, a, a new name, looks like a new technique, right? I'm going to uh, give you a slide which uh, hopefully clarifies some of the nomenclature. But uh, in fact, what autoencoder or very VEE is doing is uh, uh, very, very um, you know, uh, similar to what a Helmholtz machine is doing. 
basically you still have uh, the latent uh, variable and uh, you have uh, you know, a generative model to the observation. You can do multiple layers in here, okay? And you have priors for these parameters. And then there is a generative model, okay? And uh, there's also a inference model going you know, backward to approximate the posterior. And uh, in the Helmholtz machine, uh, you are going to uh, directly solve uh, this uh, inference model uh, using a weak sleep algorithm, which actually, as I mentioned, uh, you know, uh, employs two relaxations, which uh, gets the approximation rather bad, but it gives you something. VE is uh, uh, introducing another technique here to uh, 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 simplify the procedure so that you don't have to use the second uh, uh, relaxation. It's still solving the same, you know, uh, you know, lower bound of the data likelihood, but uh, you are going to constrain this uh, inference model so that it is uh, simpler to solve. That's basically what's VE. So it's not a new model, okay? It's a, a technique that applies to many existing or newly invented models. So it's actually an inference algorithm. That's what's VE. And of course, you know, we all know about uh, the, uh, the, the, the generative adversarial networks GAN model. And uh, so here is basically what it does. Uh, instead of uh, having, you know, uh, explicit uh, hidden variables and the conditional distributions of the observation X, given the hidden variables in here, uh, it is doing something a little bit uh, uh, fancier. You know, it starts from uh, some uh, uh, you know, uh, stochastic noise, Z, okay? It can be Gaussian noise. And uh, you can define distribution on that. And then it's uh, going through a deterministic transformation, G, so that uh, Z is uh, converted into X. Okay, so that's basically the generative process. It's through noise plus a deterministic transformation. That's a generative process. But then there's also a discriminator in here, D, which uh, uh, qualifies the resultant uh, samples, okay, such that uh, it wants uh, the, uh, the samples to be, uh, first of all, you know, uh, the, the qualifiers want to uh, make sure that uh, uh, it distinguishes true examples from uh, uh, true, uh, you know, truly, uh, you, know, uh, you, know, uh, you know, authentic data from the generated data. Okay, so it has a discriminant function to tell whether the data is fake or synthetic or, or real. And now, of course, uh, uh, this one should uh, really, uh, you know, uh, achieve uh, the discriminability uh, metric. But uh, this uh, generative process should uh, uh, be optimized toward fooling this D as much as possible to pass, you know, the discrimination. So these are two adversarial kind of uh, uh, force is uh, leading to an equilibrium. At the end of the day, you have a generative process, which uh, hopefully, you know, given you know, a stable discriminator, still able to achieve the best uh, uh, authenticity you know, uh, defined by the discriminator. And uh, again, along this line, there are many new kind of uh, variations, which I don't have time to go over in detail, but I'm going to focus on you know, uh, illustrating what is behind the GAN model and the VE model in this particular lecture. Okay, so that's the, the outline. Again, a disclaimer, before I go through, by the way, today's lecture will be a little bit more mathematical than usual, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, they are easy enough for you to digest. But before that, I want to uh, clear some uh, uh, confusion in the, in the nomenclature. Uh, this is a very, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, a little bit uh, annoying culture, okay, in this community. People uh, either intentionally or subconsciously uh, come up with uh, new names for existing or old stuff. For example, we know that uh, given any generative model, by the way, generative model is a very, very common word in the literature of statistics, right? And uh, given every generative model, P of X given the, the counterpart, uh, in the reverse direction is called what? What is this? It's the posterior. It has this, uh, 
you know, a, you know, a real uh, authentic name posterior. But now this word posterior has been now reinvented in many ways and you have all these following names. It is uh, in the Helmholtz machine, for example, called uh, inference model because uh, I don't have to use the true posterior. I can introduce an uh, arbitrary conditional of uh, the latent given the observation. And therefore, you can treat them as another model. Okay, and how related they are to the original model, or well, it could be defined using some other metrics such as KL divergence. And uh, this is also technically known as a variational approximation. So I think these are still recognizable. You have an inference model. The inference model is a variational approximation to the posterior. Okay, but then things gone wild. Okay. Uh, it is also known as a uh, recognition model in some literature. I still don't actually exactly understand why it is called a recognition model. And uh, it is also called an uh, inference network because this model itself could be a network, okay, of uh, in the multi layers. It is, of course, also called a recognition network. Network and model in the literature of deep learning are sometimes interchangeable, causing eyeballs from uh, other communities. Why do you call model a network? And then uh, it's also called a encoder. Okay, that's a little bit uh, more mysterious and uh, and uh, and interesting. And uh, it's not a probabilistic encoder because uh, you are using a distribution to achieve that effect. So, what I want to say is that uh, all these are the same. Okay, they are pretty much a uh, proxy to the posterior distribution of uh, p of z given x. Okay, so when, once you see all this, you should uh, all you know, normalize them to the same term. Then this uh, generative model itself also gets interesting in the literature. The model, usually the generative model is a uh, prior plus conditional or the joint, right? And then, you know, uh, again, it is also known as the likelihood model. That's very natural. But then, you know, people uh, sometimes uh, understand it as a generative network because the model can be arbitrarily complex as a network. It is also known as the generator, and also it is known as the decoder. Uh, uh, the decoder, yes. Okay. Um, encoder and decoder is a pair, uh, usually correspond to latent to visible, visible back to latent and so forth. Okay, so this is uh, a clarification of the synonyms in the literature. And uh, I have to say that many of the papers uh, confused people because uh, without a, a, a clarification, when these names are used, uh, it causes a disconnection to the historical literature so that uh, you don't actually uh, you know, fully uh, and, uh, and understand the origin of uh, some of these techniques. And knowing the origin is very important, as I'm going to show you in a second, because uh, it helps you to understand uh, the connections between all these uh, different uh, new techniques. Okay, so let's do a quick review of uh, variational inference, right? We know that, uh, you know, uh, what is variational inference? Well, it's uh, a way to approximate, uh, you know, uh, the posterior of uh, z given x, you know, defined by a generative model. And uh, how to uh, define that? Well, it is uh, defined variationally as the solution of a optimization problem. What is this optimization problem? Well, first, let's define a lower bound of the likelihood. You already know that, right, which takes this form. And it is also known as uh, the negative free energy, which uh, even, uh, you know, illustrates you better why, why it is a lower bound, right? It is, uh, you know, the original log likelihood uh, minus, you know, a KL between the, this is the variational approximation and this is the true posterior. There is a distance between them. And the, this gap is uh, vanishing if uh, your variational is equivalent to the true posterior, okay? But of course, uh, uh, we know that the true posterior is very difficult to solve, therefore we want to use a simpler variational uh, family, such as a mean field family, Right, we, we talked about before, or such as uh, uh, solutions in the marginal polytope. We also talk about that. All these are approximations of this guy. Okay, and that's why you know it becomes uh, a variational definition. 
And uh, how to uh, solve variational inference problem? Well, typically, it's uh, very similar to a EM step. You now use uh, this, or equivalently this, as the loss function. And then you are going to maximize or minimize the, you know, uh, the, 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 the free energy you know, uh, with respect to uh, two sets of parameters. Right? One is the phi, the other is the theta. In the E step, you are going to estimate the hidden variables. Therefore, you need to really uh, estimate uh, this uh, variational parameters phi. And the way you do that is to maximize the lower bound. And uh, if you are lucky enough to have a closed form solution, then it takes this form. But in many cases, you don't have a closed form. You have to numerically approximate it or using a simpler family to approximate. And in the M step, you are going to re-estimate uh, the generative parameters theta, okay, and, uh, and uh, keeping the variational parameters fixed. Okay, so that's uh, just a review, very, very trivial and a mechanical operation. Now it's a good time to see what other algorithms are doing. All the other algorithms I just talked about, weak sleep, Helmholtz, VE, GAN, is a surrogate or maybe a relaxation from what I said before. Because what I said before are still considered difficult numerically or algebraically in many complex settings. Therefore, people just find all sorts of tricks to introduce approximations. And here is what's happening to the weak sleep. It's kind of magical, uh, uh, but uh, also it's, uh, it, it's quite clever. Remember that our you know, uh, loss function is this guy, right? By the way, I use the L and the F interchangeably. They are just uh, different by a minus sign, right? So now I'm going to minimize this uh, free energy. And the free energy is uh, defined uh, in these two terms. Usually, when you do the EM step, E step, and the M step, you are going to focus on the same loss function and uh, alternatively you know, optimize or uh, estimate phi and theta. But uh, in the case of a weak sleep algorithm, uh, in the E step, uh, suddenly the loss function is uh, swapped for a good reason, as you will see in the next slides. This becomes the new loss. It's basically flipping the direction of the KL divergence. Okay, and then you solve uh, this guy. Okay, so that's basically weak sleep. Okay, uh, interestingly, it took other people to read the original paper to derive this. The original paper didn't claim this explicitly. Okay, I don't know why, uh, whether it is a, a intentional kind of a hidden trick or uh, the author didn't mathematically recognize this and uh, invented the heuristic, I don't know. But uh, that's exactly what's happening. So why this is uh, necessary and uh, clever? Okay, so here is uh, why. So let's uh, just uh, dissect the two steps, the weak and the sleep algorithm. There is uh, a uh, weak case. Weak means that uh, you are awake, you know the surrounding, and, uh, and uh, mathematically, this uh, reflects uh, the following behavior. So in this particular step, in fact, which correspond to the M step in the variational EM algorithm, you estimate the theta, okay? And your loss function is the true loss. It's the authentic lower bound of the likelihood, data likelihood. And uh, this is equivalent to uh, solving this maximization problem. You can see it is uh, maximization over theta and the term to be maximized is the expectation of uh, uh, the, the log generative model, okay, expected over uh, the inference model uh, with respect to the hidden variables, okay? And uh, the inference model, of course, uh, is uh, hopefully available from the previous step. And what does this expectation entails? It entails the following step, right? You can sample basically the hidden variables uh, from this distribution so that uh, the hidden variables become observed and then everything becomes a trivial in MLE setting. And uh, the sampling is using, you know, the evidence X as uh, the conditioning part. That's why it is called a weak algorithm. You are awake, you know the X. And this is easy. 
Now the next step. The next step uh, has uh, run into some uh, difficulties. If you follow the same loss function like this one, it turns out that uh, you need to now uh, solve uh, this problem. You know, remember that this uh, translates to this operation problem. But uh, instead of uh, maximizing over theta, and in this case, we are maximizing over the phi. And uh, this phi is influencing both the turn, actually now influencing the turn that is uh, under the expectation, rather than the turn originally inside the expectation. Okay, and uh, algebraically, it can be shown that this is very difficult. For example, you know, we, uh, you can take derivative of this guy, okay, with respect to phi, and it turns out that you have to deal with this term. Okay, in either a sampling technique or in a, uh, uh, in a uh, say, a specific, uh, you know, approx determinist approximation step. There is a term in here called the log of uh, the original data likelihood, which uh, has uh, a arbitrary scale. Log of a probability can be, you know, very negative, right? Therefore, it basically causes you to have a high variance a tiny change in here, or a tiny mistake you made in estimating the theta, because we are iteratively re-estimating theta, you got to make some mistake, will be amplified by this log to get a high numerical value, and that will be the gradient of uh, your update of the phi, which, of course, further escalate the, 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 the problem, the, in, the instability of the estimator, okay? And it is very hard to overcome. Therefore, uh, this uh, new trick is to invert the direction of the KL so that uh, in this uh, particular step, in the step of estimating the phi, I'm going to now estimate this term instead. You can see that this term versus the previous term, remember here, what is here and what is here, and also see what is uh, here and what is here they become exchanged, right? So now the thing to be maximized is only influencing a term within the expectation. Okay, so that is very simple. But on the other hand, to really numerically compute this, you need to now dream up samples because you need to come up with both the z and the x. You ignore the given x, you are going to come up with instantiations of x. And that's why it's called a sleep. You need to dream up all these samples. Okay, so very, very interesting and inspirational name. But uh, what's behind it is uh, a uh, mathematical compromise that you secondarily relax the original optimality function. So this one is no longer used. You use this one instead. This one is correct, by the way. This one is incorrect. But uh, for being incorrect, you gain a computational advantage. Okay, so that's the weak sleep algorithm. Okay, so side by side, let's do a comparison. Everything remains the same. You, uh, from the beginning, you basically introduce a inference model or the variational approximation. And uh, in the M step, okay, you basically are going to uh, estimate uh, the theta. And uh, here is your loss function. They are all the same. And uh, in the sleep phase, or in the variational E phase, here you do what you should do, and here you turn the problem easier. Okay, and get, uh, well, in a nice way you say it, you get an approximation, but in reality, it's just a different thing. It's not even an approximation. Approximating what? We don't actually know. Okay, because this reverse direction of the KL can be anything. Okay, it can be, you know, a positive and negative, it can, can be a lot of things. Uh, therefore, it gives you some new estimation of the model, and you use this a new estimation of the model to impute the hidden variable and the observe, and you continue and uh, iterate and converge. You actually don't know where you're converging to. Okay, this convergence uh, hasn't been analyzed before in terms of their approximation to the true, uh, you know, uh, posterior. But in any case, you know, uh, you get something. So that's why, you know, you can call the weak sleep 
either as a heuristic algorithm or implicitly it is a new model. Okay, it is a new model because you are getting a new model by mistaking the true model. You get some other things. So they are not going to converge, but in case you converge, you can use it for interesting applications. Now, given this, let's look at uh, VEE, okay? As I said, VEE is uh, uh, model-wise uh, no different from uh, any generative model, but uh, uh, it is uh, doing something uh, different than the weak sleep algorithm in estimating the inference model. As I said, the inference model is uh, very hard to estimate you know, if you uh, use the original loss function, this one, because uh, the gradient with respect to the phi has a high variance, right? So in this case, instead of uh, changing the loss function, the authors uh, stick to the original loss function, but they are going to uh, restrict uh, the, this guy, restrict this, uh, this, uh, uh, this one, okay? Instead of uh, just assuming a arbitrary or a uh, you know a designed network model of uh, the for the inference or the, uh, maybe the inference network, let's do something extremely simple. Let's just assume that the hidden variable is uh, uh, is a uh, deterministic uh, uh, transformation from uh, the input plus some noise. Okay. So it's a very, very simple trick. This transformation is a uh, you know, parameterized transformation, for example, and you can, de you know, you can de design it. And then if you have that, then taking derivative of everything becomes easier. Okay. Uh, for example, here is a, a one often used, right? You just, uh, again, uh, use uh, a uh, Gaussian transformation, okay? And, uh, and, and, and a, a, a standard uh, white noise and that gives you uh, a way to come up with the hidden variables. Again, this uh, hidden variable Z, uh, you know, uh, is uh, not, you know, uh, the, you know, not necessarily close to the true posterior Z given X in the original generative model, uh, but at least you have a way to push them close to each other by minimizing this uh, very coherent uh, uh, lower bound or the KL divergence you know, uh, between the, tr the posterior and this variational posterior. Okay, so that's the VAE algorithm. Uh, it has some interesting effects. That's uh, worth noting. Uh, people at the beginning don't know how to explain that, but I'm going to explain it in a second after I develop the math. Here are some of the image outcome of uh, a VAE model. Uh, people found that it is uh, blurred. Okay, you know, you can see all these kind of effects. That's also potentially why the VE model was not in favor at the very beginning, because no one wants to see blurred pictures. Okay, image is a very, very strange space where a human has strong bias for a certain style. For example, if you have a Van Gogh style or some twisted style like an uh, abstract artist, uh, people like it. Uh, whether it's right or wrong, I don't know. Okay, but people like it. Fortunately, uh, such a effect gets more appreciation in the NLP domain, uh, which uh, allows you to have a very interesting smooth transfer between two extremes. For example, these are the sentences generated by VAE. Uh, instead of uh, a contrast to the vague uh, blurred image, such blurred sentences can be very interesting. You know, I started uh, two extremes. I want to talk to you, and uh, she didn't Want, uh, she didn't want to be with him. And you see all sorts of uh, uh, interesting interpolations and uh, you know, uh, middle grounds between these two extremes, which can be very interesting. Okay, so human perceive languages very differently from image. Uh, we always say we are ambiguous, uh, we are strategically ambiguous. That means uh, ambiguity in language is uh, something people appreciate. Right? Ambiguity in image is not. Right. So again, that's very, very, I found that to be amusing and, and quite, quite, uh, quite uh, enlightening. Now, GAN models. Uh, yeah, for the very same reason I just said, GAN models was widely appreciated because it gives you amazing pictures which uh, you can hang on the wall and uh, still appreciate, right? And as if it is a true art piece because it's 
not blurred. It's sharp, but it has a style. So what is the gun model? You know, as I just said, it has a generative model, which uh, is coming from a very strange process, you know, noise plus transformation, determinist transformation. It defines an implicit distribution. You can never write down an analytic form of the distribution, but such a distribution exists. Okay. And then it has a discriminator, which try to uh, you know, uh, uh, tell apart the synthetic samples from the true samples. And uh, the better you train this discriminator, the better you need to improve the generator so that it can fool the discriminators. And this uh, you know, uh, contention or this uh, equilibrium is uh, leading to, you know, so to speak, good generators. Okay? And uh, again, when it is invented, uh, there is no obvious connection to all what I said before. Variational inference, weak sleep, there is uh, nothing related to that because it's so strange. This, uh, this uh, whole business is uh, very, very uh, uh, different from what people do. And uh, so here is how it's different, right? So the learning algorithm basically allows you, uh, in a, you know, necessitates you to solve a minimax problem. On the one hand, you want to maximize the, the discriminability of uh, the discriminator. And in the other case, you want to you know, minimize the loss against this discriminator from the generative model. So that's basically the problem you need to solve. Okay? This is uh, you know, different from EM principles, right? And that's why people have not thought about the connections you know, between uh, uh, you know, GAN and the other historical thing. And that was also one of the reasons why when the GAN model was proposed, it was hailed as a totally novel and a different innovation. Okay? Because the, both the naming and also the mathematics appear to be very different. And there are some, some, some nuances here, you know, because uh, you know, uh, uh, there are some uh, 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 you know, uh, vanishing gradient kind of uh, you know, uh, artifacts in the original loss function. Uh, if you choose to, min uh, to uh, put the 1 minus d in the log, now people re flip the basically the direction and uh, maximize you know, this turn only. Okay. But uh, it's just an a, a algebraic trick. Okay. And uh, you can easily guess that uh, maybe in the equilibrium, the best uh, uh, you know, uh, type of uh, uh, generator should be the data set itself. Right, ideally, and the best discriminator should uh, not be able to, you know, it, because it is so good in generating, therefore they should uh, uh, have a random chance of being recognized or not. So that's just the, the limiting case. Okay, and the results are very interesting. You know, these are the images uh, due to GAN models. They are very sharp, they are usable. Images are usable like this. And, uh, but uh, uh, people find that uh, they seem to uh, cover to be highly dependent on the training data set. They seem to be able to pick up the major uh, populations of the image. For example, if you have an image set of 100 Van Gogh paintings and 10 Rubens paintings and uh, maybe one Picasso paintings, okay, then your generative model will only give you the Van Gogh pictures. The other things are ignored. It was a little puzzling, but people are not bothered. You know, I like Van Gogh, so, so be it. Right. Okay, so that's uh, the GAN model. And uh, because of this, uh, in fact, if you look at the years, it's also very magical. They are proposed uh, at the same year. It's also very, very recent. It's just uh, merely four or five years ago. But now you already see a whole zoo of uh, uh, deep generative models. In fact, if you go to CVPR, uh, maybe uh, 60 to 70% of the papers are about uh, GAN models. Okay. Even if you go to ACL, you know, uh, language conference, I think there is still a non-trivial percentage. Now, even if you go to NIPS and ISML, also many, many such papers. Um, it's actually quite exciting, you know, uh, in fact, uh, to uh, enable new capabilities because now you can synthesize contents, you know, using model. In the past, the model is for us to, you know, make predictions and infer about facts. Here, you add a dimension of creativity. But uh, the way to produce these models, I would say, is uh, quite crafty, right? You, you, you maybe uh, uh, change a loss, 
uh, you draw a new graph, a new network, uh, so that uh, more structures and knowledge can be included. Uh, or maybe you just uh, play around the algorithm to make it a little bit more uh, you know, fast or, uh, or something. Uh, you probably also heard a debate in NIPS. Uh, some people, <laughs> myself and others, you know, call it uh, acme. You know, you, you, you blend things together and you get something fancy out of it, but you don't know why, what's happening, right? But uh, if you look at uh, you know, how people do chemistry, well, all these elements has a periodic table, you actually know how they are related, right? You actually, you, when you mix two things together, you can predict its uh, property, you know, if you are really a chemist. You actually also predict that maybe two uh, elements cannot work together because uh, their you know, uh, electromagnetic <laughs> properties is incompatible and so forth. And such a ledger is not uh, uh, present uh, in the deep generative model community in the past. People don't really know what's going on. So what I'm going to do now is to uh, uh, try to provide a unified view of the deep generative models to give you at least a first approximation to uh, how they exactly uh, you know, uh, connect, okay, based on some common statistical ground. And this is a work by, in fact, the next lecturer, you already see him last time, uh, Zhi Ting, who actually uh, you know, uh, worked very extensively in this field and know about uh, all this uh, recent and historical work. Okay, so, uh, the unified view, okay, is to really reconcile, you know, the previously two disconnected field of uh, GAN models and the VE models, plus many other instantiations. And uh, now let's take a closer look of the GAN model, okay. The, 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 the trick we use are really, you know, about, you know, staring at this uh, original definition and see how can we massage it into some form that we know about in the literature. And then see you know, uh, how exactly the formula uh, may differ you know, from uh, the older work. So for example, here is uh, the vanilla way of uh, writing down the GAN model. I just copy here. You have an implicit distribution of uh, the generated data. Okay, so this one, even though I write it, as a distribution, it is implicit. You don't know the form because uh, it is uh, produced through this two process. If your, zero, if your indicator Y is zero, that means it is synthetic. Well, you have this synthetic process, which is kind of mysterious. Noise plus, plus uh, uh, you know, transformation. If it is, uh, therefore you don't know the form, right, of the distribution. And uh, if it is uh, uh, a uh, true data point, from your data set, then you don't know that either because uh, you don't actually know the true distribution of the data. Therefore, this whole thing is implicit. But still, we can symbolically express it. Okay, so this is our conventional uh, formulation of uh, the learning algorithm. It has nothing to do with our version EM algorithm. It doesn't look the same, right? In the, but uh, after we, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, tied up you know, uh, some uh, expression. For example, we now have a uh, implicit distribution of X. And uh, we also could uh, you know, define you know, a discriminative distribution, Q, okay, given X, and also its reverse. It turns out that the above uh, conventional formalism can be rewritten into this form, which is uh, I have to say quite clean, it's cleaner, right? And here I have a graphical, well this is not really a graphic model, but you can use a graph to kind of uh, capture what's happening. You know, you have a random variable x, which is, uh, uh, well in this case, it, it is generated, but, uh, uh, but it's not in the traditional sense. You are not sampled x from a distribution. You basically have a, a, a procedure coming from z, right? And then, uh, X leads to a Y through this uh, discriminant distribution, and you can define a posterior accordingly, at least symbolically. Okay, so now it's interesting to put the GAN and the VEM side by side and see how they 
relates, right? So in the VE, we have uh, two steps over phi and the theta. Remember, the theta are the generative parameters, okay, from uh, hidden to observed x. And uh, then the phi are the inference parameters, okay, uh, to allow you to go backward and infer the hidden variables. And they are treated in the deep network literature as two separate models or two separate networks. And then they have a, a single you know, loss function in here. Okay. And uh, then you alternate between this uh, theta and the phi. And uh, in here, you know, you know, the terms uh, that you need to deal with, one is uh, this uh, generative model, right? That's to be estimated. And uh, this is uh, the inference model, which is uh, also to be estimated as a auxiliary. In fact, at the end of the day, you only use this, but not use this. Now the gun model, once you re-parameterize like the way I did before, it actually turns into these two steps. You also are maximizing alternatively between the x, uh, the theta, and the phi. And uh, here you have, uh, unfortunately, two different uh, loss function. But they are very, very similar. To, uh, they are very related to each other. Be basically, one is the reverse of the other, okay, due to the discriminative loss, okay? And uh, if you follow what we did in here, you could uh, even uh, characterize, you know, all the uh, terms that uh, are dispute, all the other all the forms that you care about here. For example, this uh, five of uh, x, a y given x, which is uh, basically the conditional diffusion of the label given, you know, the sample can be called a generative model. This is very strange because originally we are generating x. Now we call p of uh, a q of a y given x to be a generative model y. Or because it is a purely a symbolic translation because here this term which uh, happened uh, inside this and uh, inside this occupies the position of being a generative model. Okay, so just for that reason, we just, uh, you know, put in a call whatever occupies the inner expectation analog kind of uh, place to be the generative model. And uh, this guy, which is uh, in here, in the expectation, okay, this is called the inference model because you use them as a vehicle to impute the hidden. And in here, same thing, because this guy is in here. So you call this guy to be the inference model. Okay, so very strange. The x which is to be generated, now the distribution of x is, uh, in this case, you know, corresponding to an inference model in the original variational inference setting. So why we do all this? Well, because uh, we want to build the connection between VEM and uh, this new gun model because we know a lot about the behavior of VEM. Right, and then maybe we can use the behavior there to interpret the phenomena in the gun. So here we can already, you know, make the following uh, discovery. Here we can interpret the, the x as a latent variable. Well, it, it makes sense because as x is to be generated, you don't actually have it, right? Even though z is, uh, you know, a latent, uh, uh, you know, variable symbolically, but uh, in the gun process, z is just uh, a noise that is, uh, you know, triggering the generation. What you really generate is the x, and the x you don't know it. Therefore, we can treat them as a latent variable. And uh, we interpret the generation of x as performing an inference because now it's a latent variable. Therefore, you know, to, you know, uh, impute the latent variable, whether you call it the generate or what, you know, it's inference as what we did in variational EM. Okay, so that's just a uh, kind of a uh, terminology uh, mapping, so to speak, between GAN and the VEM. Then the next one is more interesting. In VEM, you know, remember, a key thing that we did is that, uh, you know, we have this uh, loss function, which is, uh, you know, uh, related to this one, they're the same, in fact, by a, a sign, minus sign. But uh, the effect we want to achieve is to minimize the KL divergence between these two things. The KL between this guy, which is the inference model, and this guy, which is the posterior model. 
the posterior distribution, right? So basically, remember in VE, all we need to do is to minimize the inference, the KR between inference and the posterior. Okay, that's uh, a high level way of understanding that. Now, with this context, what the GAN model is doing? That leads us to understanding a little bit more about uh, what GAN is generating, because so far, mathematically, we have no idea what GAN is generating. Okay, it somehow come from noise and come from a transformation, and then it's discriminated against some real data set, but what do you get in the end? We don't actually know. There is no mathematical characterization of the resultant distribution. For the first time now, using this language in VEM, we could tell a little bit more about that. So it's kind of mathematical. So uh, if you are interested, you can go to the paper I just referred to. There are some theory and some proofs. But uh, it can be shown that, uh, let's look at one step in the uh, GAN model estimation. The one step means that uh, you started from some point. You started from a uh, initial estimation of the theta and the phi, call them zero. And uh, you are going to get a new version theta and the phi. What's happening? Okay. It turns out that this update from uh, theta zero to theta amounts to minimizing this term. Two terms. One is a KL between two distributions. And interestingly, you have uh, the two distributions to be a P of uh, X given Y and another Q of X given Y. They are the same that distribution on the same random variable, but uh, you know, in two contexts. Isn't that quite similar to what we said here about the inference model and the posterior model, right? The distribution of the same hidden random variable H or Z, you know, uh, given some different context. And the other term is uh, this one, you don't want to worry about it. It's called the jensen shannon divergence. It is symmetric, therefore, uh, you know, at least uh, it's not helpful for you to understand what the resultant distribution is, so we ignore that. So let's take a deeper look of uh, what these terms are inside here. This guy, you know, uh, we have a prior distribution of x, and the uh, y is visible because we know whether it is true or false. And uh, this distribution, q reverse of x given y, is proportional to the Q reverse of the discriminator and also the previous estimation of the, what is this? Well, this is the implicit distribution of X. The implicit distribution of X, I'm going to show you how it looks like. It's very interesting. It's actually a mixture of uh, the previous step generator distribution and the data distribution. And uh, this one is something that we want to solve, right? Our uh, new version of the inference model uh, over x, you know, uh, uh, parameterized by theta. And uh, this is, we could call this a variational approximation, a distribution. So in a sense, the effect of uh, this particular step in the GAN learning is to minimize the distances between these two, okay? And uh, what's the effect? Yeah, just to compare, in VEE, of VEM, we are going to minimize this KL, okay? And in the, in the GAN model, we are going to minimize this KL, okay? That's actually already a, uh, a very uh, interesting uh, revelation about uh, what you get out of it. So here uh, is a complex graph, uh, which gives you uh, the geometric kind of insight about what's happening. Remember that our goal is to uh, minimize uh, this KL. Again, we can break them into two parts because it is conditioning on Y. Y could only take two values, either zero or one. If it is one, then it's coming from the true data points, not interesting. Okay, it's like uh, the, the, the generative model isn't used. And the Y equal to zero is the interesting part and our goal is basically to minimize uh, this. Minimize the KL between this is equivalent to draw this closer to this or vice versa, right? So what is this? This is uh, basically uh, the target. I claim that this is the green curve in here, 
I actually colored all the equations and the curve so that you can see a one-to-one -one correspondence. Why it is? So look at the form of the definition. The Q reverse of x given y equal to 0 proportional to the probability of predicting y equal to 0 given x times the implicit distribution of x. Okay, when theta equals to 0, basically the previous implicit distribution. And the previous uh, implicit distribution come from two sources. One is uh, when data is real. The other is uh, when data is uh, synthetic based on the previous estimation of uh, the generative model. Right? So therefore, theta equal to zero. So this uh, blue curve and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the red curve are where we start from when theta equals to theta zero. Okay, we want to start from there and uh, estimate a new theta. And these two things actually form a mixture, which is the green stuff. That is, uh, you know, the equation on the right-hand side of the KL divergence. Okay? And to minimize that means that the next estimation of the red, the new red, should be drawn closer to the green one. Right? So here is our red one before the estimation. And this is the red one after the estimation, and you can see the effect is to drag this red one closer to the green one. Okay, And also, this uh, distance is measured by a KL of uh, red to green, meaning that uh, it is uh, a particular divergence that allows the closeness to be achieved by matching all the modes as much as you can. Therefore, this mode is covered, this mode is covered, and uh, some small mode may fail to be covered, but uh, they still have a chance. Okay? So that's why basically, you know, you can see the, 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 the gun model uh, is uh, sharp, but uh, missing modes, right? When it's sharp, when it is covering a particular mode like this, it is sharp. I'm going to really uh, take, uh, be, be very, very similar to any data in these uh, major modes of uh, the data. But uh, when it is uh, not covering some modes, like in this case, you don't actually get any sample generated because there is no mass in this particular space. Okay. So that basically is the, 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 the magic behind the gun. It, it, it managed to learn a distribution that is uh, covering the major modes in the data. Remember, this uh, blue guy is invariant. It's basically the reference data set. Right, it's not invariant. Therefore, you are try to basically learning, you know, a green curve or the, the red curve that is uh, closer and closer to the blue one, but uh, not including the minor modes. Okay, so that's basically what's happening. Drag the uh, the posterior or the, the the inference model to the data model. Okay. Uh, okay, so I already said this. Basically, you know, it will miss some of, some of the modes. Uh, in the data distribution. Clear about the KL diversion, uh, the KL explanation of GAN. Now let's go to the, 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 command, the, the VAE. Okay, we just use the same kind of uh, strategy. Uh, we look at the vanilla definition, we re-parameterize it, and uh, then we, again, can arrive at uh, you know, a uh, more uh, kind of uh, aligned expression of uh, the loss function, you know, uh, comparing to uh, the VEE model, or uh, the VEM model, the variational EM model. Here, there are a few crucial distributions, uh, which uh, happens in the two sides of the KL divergence, by the way. So this basically is the target. You can see that all this, uh, uh, you know, uh, estimation or learning procedure, at the end of the day, is to minimize the KL between some distributions. That's basically a major kind of direction we are trying to drive toward. Because when you have a KL, you can always measure it against a reference distribution. And then you basically can say something about uh, the result in the distribution that you are optimizing, right? And in here, what is the reference? What is the resultant? Well, somehow it's becoming uh, reversed, okay? So in here, uh, uh, we did some uh, additional trick to
to allow the VE to be better compared to GAN and uh, other uh, and, and the variational EM. For example, we introduced a Y, which wasn't present in the original uh, VE model. Uh, but uh, here, uh, introducing Y is, uh, uh, get, is making the, the expression okay, more aligned with the, the previous one, unless you don't do anything uh, inconsistent with the GAN setting. For example, here, the Y is uh, a indicator, but it is a degenerated indicator. It is always indicating it is false. You are always basically producing, uh, you know, uh, uh, generated examples. Okay, and uh, therefore it is a deterministic distribution, a deterministic function. Uh, so, uh, so this one basically become a degenerate function, right? And uh, this guy is uh, a uh, what is the inference model, okay, uh, in the original variational setting, you are basically using x to infer the, uh, the z uh, latent variable. Remember, in the, variation, in the VE model, you actually are using the training data as x, okay, to estimate all the parameters. Therefore, the x are actually observed in this case, and uh, your goal is to uh, you know, uh, estimate the z, the latent variable. In this uh, case, it's just a variational inference of deep generative models. But uh, on the other side, you have uh, a posterior. This posterior is uh, kind of uh, peculiar uh, because uh, it can be re-parameterized by this. Okay. And uh, here, this one is uh, pretty trivial. A prior of the label, you can always uh, set a uh, fixed prior. And the uh, prior of uh, the z given y, well, it has nothing to do with the generative mechanism. It's about uh, choosing the prior of the latent. Uh, therefore, we don't have uh, uh, anything to do with the theta, the generative models. This one is how you generate x from the z. That's basically the core of the VE generative mechanism, right? So somehow the generative parameters in here is on the posterior side rather than on the inference side. Remember in the GAN model, our key parameters in the generative function is on the left-hand side of the KL. In here it's different. Maybe just to show a bit more clearly, we can have this table side by side, right? So in the GAN and the VE, you have uh, the following generative distribution, <clears throat> which uh, in this case is uh, implicit, and in this case, it depends on the latent variable z, because it's a proper conditional distribution. And then you have the discriminator in the GAN model, that's a key part to really uh, enforce authenticity. But in here, it is uh, a uh, vacuous symbolic uh, degenerated term. And uh, well, in the GAN model, actually, you don't care about the inference z, so there is actually no uh, z uh, posterior. But you can still you know, introduce one. In fact, some models uh, allow you to introduce the z just for the sake of uh, uh, providing maybe ad additional interpretability or vehicle of uh, uh, generating samples. Uh, but uh, they are not often utilized. But in here, you have a true uh, variational uh, you know, approximation or the inference model because you need to use the z to impute the hidden variables to allow you to do maximum likelihood estimation in the EM step. And then the KL, that's the key. In here, you are minimizing this P theta, which is uh, at least in the gun setting, the generative model where you produce the x, okay, using, you know, uh, z or other things. And in here, your p theta, which is the generative model of uh, the x given z, is on the other side of the KL divergence. Okay. So once I put this side by side, you probably can see why the GAN model and the VE model have a very, very different uh, uh, you know, uh, empirical, dis uh, the, the resultant distribution. One is sharp, but uh, focus on certain modes. The other is a blurred, but uh, you know, uh, but uh, giving you smooth interpolations between different distributions. Because uh, a KL, once you revert the direction, 
you know, allows you to approximate, uh, for example, here, suppose this is the target distribution, a KL like this, let's say one, is uh, giving you this way of approximating. Usually it is uh, inside that single mode or a few modes. But uh, if uh, you are doing, let's say, uh, okay, so this is a one. And uh, let's try another color. Uh, let's say maybe uh, the green one, for example. So two. What does that K approximately look like? Right? So that's basically uh, what KL minimization leads you. Depending on direction, you get uh, the approximating distribution as a uh, kind of a, a uh, you know, inclusive approximation or a uh, more narrow approximation. Okay? Which one you prefer is a matter of taste. Right? Some people like sharp distribution. I can capture one mode. Good. The other one say, okay, I don't mind uh, precisely capture every mode, but I want to cover all the modes. Then the other direction is prevailing. Okay, so uh, this is pretty much uh, you know, uh, the connection between the VEE and the GAN versus uh, the uh, the version of EM algorithm, and again here you can see you know these are two you know uh, directions of uh, the KL after we derived uh, you know uh, the rim parameterized the gun model and the VE model reflects the two behaviors of approximation. Okay, again this insight of uh, uh, connection between uh, the gun and the VE back to the weak sleep and the version inference actually. Uh, reveals more results than just the uh, just the, the the mode approximation or, or the generative effects. There are other uh, good benefits which uh, uh, Zhi Ting may cover in the next few lectures, but uh, for the interest of time, I'm going to pass that. So just let, let's wrap up. So just link back to the weak sleep algorithm. Remember, in the weak sleep algorithm, you know we have uh, latent variables and uh, parameters, and uh, you are going to basically uh, introduce uh, a distribution over the latent variables. This is called the inference network, remember, or the inference model. Okay, do you still remember what's the other name? There, are, I, I, I gave you a slide of all these fancy synonyms. Can you name the most fancy name out of that list? Encoder, yes, <laughs> that's called encoder as well, yes. So, yeah inference network, encoders, or maybe recognition networks. So this is uh, uh, going to be in here. And then you also have uh, the generative model, and then you alternatively you know, estimating these two models. And also um, you are going to change the uh, loss function uh, like this. What's happening in the, in the VE is that uh, you stick with uh, the loss function in the weak step. Okay, you are going to only, you know, uh, optimize this loss function, okay? And uh, by, you know, uh, estimating uh, the generative parameters and also eta the inference parameters, but uh, the major trick you use is to re-parameterize the inference network so that they become easier to handle. And the chaos story is already presented, right? In, uh, it gives you a particular direction in uh, approximating the inference model. And then the GAN model is actually taking the loss function in here, okay, uh, as its, uh, as its uh, uh, target. And it is not going to do the weak step, okay? So in here, you are going to now, you know, estimate uh, basically, uh, alternatively, the generative parameters and also the discriminative parameters. Okay, in this case, there are no, you know, uh, inference parameters. And uh, your loss function basically is uh, about, uh, you know, uh, the hidden variable given uh, the x, given the data. Okay, so 
now you can see you know how this uh, different technique connects. Uh, they basically are uh, try to uh, subselect, you know, uh, you know, select a subset of uh, the objectives or the techniques, you know, uh, as uh, uh, the the whole design of the the model framework, and then uh, the, the 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 human effort is to really design, you know. Uh, different uh, parameterizations, you know, of uh, the model. For example, this uh, uh, implicit distribution is resulting from uh, the noise. Usually, people don't play too much with noise. It's a Gaussian noise, but you can play with a transformation of all, all kinds. And that transformation could be a big network of many, many layers of theta, right? And people can play with the data. You can introduce different data sets to achieve different effects, right? All right, with that, uh, I hope Oops, what's this? All right. I don't know what's going on here. But uh, I'm done. I have uh, only one more slide to go, which summarizes uh, what's said today. Uh, you know, the most fundamental principle governing all these, uh, you know, uh, new inventions of the neural network or deep learning models is the variational proximity principle, okay, rooted from the graphic model inference. You have the generative model, you have uh, the posterior model, and uh, when you need to approximate the posterior model, you introduce the variational technique, which minimizes the lower bound of the KL divergence, a lower bound of the likelihood, and then you choose all sorts of uh, different uh, approximations, relaxations, or new algorithms to achieve that effect. Okay, I think uh, that's all for, for today. Uh, I'm going to hand the lecture uh, duty to some of my students to present you some uh, new developments uh, in the space of uh, deep generative models in the next three lectures. Thanks. <laughs>